You have to be given joy. You can't do anything in your life, and I can't do anything in my life to produce joy. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The best way I can give a description to you about joy, it was said of Jesus that he endured the cross despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. The, he who went and endured the most horrific thing ever upon this planet did so with joy. The night before he left, this earth, before the night he was uh, uh, betrayed and arrested, he spoke to his disciples of the joy that he had and how he was going to give that joy to them. I bring you good tidings of great joy. This joy that we have, this way maybe I can describe it, it's kind of like when you're reading a book or you're watching a movie and you already know the ending and you already know that it's going to turn out good. Even though the character or the hero is going through a very, very bad, bad time, you know everything's going to turn out good and everything's going to turn out right. And you can watch it with that full, calm assurance, hey, it's going to be right. For our lives as children of God and for those who've experienced salvation, there are a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of trials and tribulations. There's a lot of mountain tops and valleys. But we have this calm, fulfilling assurance that when it's all said and done and the day is over and time is no more, it's not just going to turn out right. It's going to turn out perfect. And we're going to be in that perfect place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And we have that relationship with God that's going to bring us a, a body that's going to be just like the resurrected body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is our source of joy. Of what has taken place in and through our salvation. And no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad the times are, you look down toward the end of your life here and toward eternity and you know it's just right. You see, we've read the end of the book. We've seen the end of the movie. For those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's not just a good ending, it's a perfect ending. It's not just uh, walking off in, into the sunset, it's eternal life in Jesus Christ in the wonderful place that God has provided for us there in heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So, read with me here, Luke chapter 2, and let's drop down to verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Please join me in prayer. Father, how our hearts have been so uplifted this morning as we fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we've come into this beautiful place you provided for us to assemble as your people. Father, we uh, uh, ha have lifted up our voices in singing. The choir has led us in worship and praise. And oh, our hearts have been stirred as we think back on the great love you had for us in sending your son. And this time of the year as we celebrate his birth, it indeed is the most 
joyous time of the year. Our prayer now and our desire is to have you speak to our hearts. I pray you would use me to speak your truth in a mighty way this morning. I pray you would give clarity through my words and you, through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, would have these words to become alive and living in the hearts of this, your people. And Father, may we know you better. May we be drawn closer to you. May we have a, a greater thankfulness of what you've done for us in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That, that phrase, Savior and Christ the Lord, is the only time you find in the Christmas story all of these things linked together. This baby is the Savior. This baby is the Christ. This baby is the Lord. This child brings the joy. The joy of Christmas. And he real, his coming reveals to each person the joy that God has in store for us. So, as we look for the next few moments, Christmas is the joy of the birth of the Son. <coughs> Christmas, the joy that comes at Christmas is the blessing of the Savior. And the joy that comes at Christmas is the birth of the Sovereign. Three things I want us to see. It's about a birth, it's about a Savior, and it's about a Lord. And how these things are integrally entwined, and you can't have one without the other. Uh, and the first thing that we see here is the birth that takes place. Unto you is born. Unto you is born. It's all about a birth. You know, for the most part, births don't get a lot of attention outside of the immediate family. Uh, it just doesn't get a whole lot of attention. I, I read this a while back, and it talked about some births in a particular year and how those births shaped uh, the, 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 this world more than any other time period because of the births, births that came that year. It was the year 1809. In that year, in 1809, Napoleon was uh, uh, just running through uh, Europe, and it looked like he would indeed establish, reestablish the Roman Empire. But in that year, some people were born that, that really had a great influence and an impact upon this world. In that year, there were some uh, men born that through the writings that they did shaped the world and the culture of this world. Alfred Lord Tennyson was born that year. And, and so was Oliver Wendell Holmes and Edgar Allan Poe. And, and man, these guys, through their writings, they sh they shaped man's thoughts and thinking. Also that year, William Gladstone was born. He became about the greatest prime minister England ever had. Also in that year, 1809, a man was born by the name of Charles Darwin. And through his theory of evolution, he did more damage to men and their thinking and, uh, and turning away from God through the uh, theories that he came up with. And also that year, in a little cabin up in Hardin County, Kentucky, a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln was born. And boy, what a, what a stalwart he was in keeping our nation together. And the fact that our nation stayed together, we have played such a pivotal role in the world that we live in. And the, and the, and the writer that I was reading said, <coughs> the births that year of 1809 that came about they shaped this world more than any other. Well, that's just simply not true. 2,000 years ago, there was a baby who was born in Bethlehem that we're reading the announcement of that not only shaped this world, but he shaped eternity forever. This will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The shepherds were not told to look for a king on a throne, or they were not told to look for an angel on a cloud, but a baby in a manger. They were not told to go to a palace or a mansion, but a stable. He would not be surrounded by servants, but by sheep and oxen. He would not be wrapped 
and purple and fine things, but he would be wrapped in rags. This baby, this birth was God come down in flesh. The Word was made flesh. He came as the heavenly son of an earthly mother. He is indeed the son of God born to this earth. He, he, the favorite title for Jesus was son of man. He would use that over and over and over of himself. The son of man, the son of man. When we talk about the son of God, the son of man, we, we are talking about what we looked at last week as Isaiah said, for unto us a son is given. That's the deity of Jesus. He never had a beginning. Never was a time when he was not in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But it also talks about how a child, unto us a child, is born. His humanity. He's the God-man. This baby is God come down to become one of us. There's joy at Christmas because of the birth of this one. The birth of the Son of God. The birth of the Son of Man. The birth of the seed of the woman. The birth of the seed of Abraham. The birth of the Son of David. The birth of God's grace. The birth of light. The birth of God's mercy. The birth of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In His birth, truly joy has come to this world. I want you to understand something, though. Joy can't come to you just because he was born. It has to be an ongoing something take place in order for the good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for it to become personal to you, just as this baby was born of Mary, a virgin by the name of Mary, who was conceived by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, just as that baby was born there in Bethlehem, Jesus has to be born in your hearts. See, it takes a birth for joy to come. It took the birth of the Son of God in Bethlehem for joy to come to this world. But it takes the birth of Jesus coming in your heart for that personal application to come to your life. The birth of joy. Joy to the world. Christmas is the joy that comes from the Savior being born. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. In the Old Testament, the word Savior describes a deliverer from one's enemies. And, and the Bible is clear. I, Isaiah said in chapter 43, even I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. Isaiah 49, I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. And what you and I need to realize is that God Himself, the Lord, is the Savior. You'll never understand the meaning of Christmas and you'll never experience the joy of Christmas until you get in the heart that this joy is the coming of the Savior. And the essence of the coming of the Savior is because salvation was needed. And he brings salvation from delivering us from the power and penalty of sin. John says this in 1 John chapter 4. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. And as the angel told Joseph... 
about Mary, she shall bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And the reason that he can save from sins is because he's the Savior. you got to think about it. God saw the greatest need that we had, and that's what he sent his son to meet. If our need had been for information, God would have sent us an educator. If our need had been for technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our need had been monetary, God would have sent us an economist. If our need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But what our need was, was salvation, so God sent us a Savior. Now, a Savior speaks volumes of who He is and why He came, but it also speaks volumes of who we are. You see, only sinners need a Savior. Only people who are lost need to be saved. People have a hard time saying, I'm lost or I need salvation. But I want you to know, every person that's born in this human race, they need all the same thing. And most importantly, they need a Savior. And that's what God sent. He sent His only begotten Son to be the Savior of the world. And for Him to be our Savior, He had to be one of us. A man sinned, a man had to pay the sin debt. And that's why God had to become a man. And that's why Jesus Christ became the God-man. And how he took the form of man. And he didn't just take the form of man. He took our humanity and he became one of us. He was made flesh so that he could be made sin. So that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. That's who Jesus is. Man, so that he could die for us. He was made like us so that we could be made like him. Christmas is the joy of the birth of this baby. And Christmas is the joy of the birth of the Savior. But I want you to hang with me here now. This is where, this is where it gets a little dicey with people. They don't mind receiving a Savior, but when you tell them He's their Lord, they don't want that. You know what I can tell you about yourself? You want to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it. And you and I have been brought up, raised in a land that we've been told that we have the personal freedom to do anything we want to do and be anything we want to be. That's true. That attitude will take you straight to the pits of hell. Yeah. Let me tell you that again. It will take you straight to the pits of hell. You see, you can never have a Savior without a Lord. And that's what you want. That's what everybody wants. They want a Savior, but they don't want a Lord. The problem is you can't get it that way. Joel prayed a little earlier and he said let us turn away from our pride and our ego the Bible speaks of us coming to God in brokenness and coming in repentance that means we're turning our back on ourselves. we're turning away from what we want and what we think is best and we're turning to God who presents to us His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He presents to us the Lord. This is what, this is what the angel told them. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. But you've got to know who this Savior is. He's Christ the Lord. Amen. That identifies Him clearly. Doesn't say He's Buddha. Doesn't say He's Mohammed. He's Christ the Lord. Now that term Christ means the anointed one. And they understood emphatically and immediately when the, the, when the title Christ is given, that's the Messiah, the Meshach Nagid from the Old Testament. He's Messiah. He's the promised one. 
that God had prophesied and promised about all the way through the Old Testament. He's the Son of God. He's the Christ. But He's Lord. That identifies Him as the second person of the Trinity. God is three, yet God is one. God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this birth of this baby, He's Christ the Lord. He's not only the Son of God, He is God. He's the second person of the triune God. <coughs> He's the Christ of Christmas. He's the Lord of creation. The title Lord is used 9,000 times in the Old Testament. Listen to this. Paul, I mean, Luke wrote in Acts chapter 2, that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and and Christ. God made him that. God made him Lord. I've heard people try to say, I received Jesus Christ. I made him Lord of my life. You can't make him Lord of your life. You can receive him as Lord of your life. God's already made him Lord. Listen, he is Lord. And one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. You can't make him Lord you can receive him as Lord. You see, you want to get a Savior so you can get some fire insurance, so you can get a home in heaven and escape hell. And you'll take a cabin on the back side of heaven just to escape hell. The problem is, the Bible doesn't teach that. The problem is, you can't go to heaven that way. If you're not willing to receive Jesus as your Lord, you can't have him as your Savior. Amen. You can't have him at all. This birth that brings this glad tidings of great joy. It's about a birth of the Savior because we need salvation. But if you're going to have salvation, you're going to receive it through Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God, who's Lord. He's sovereign. It means He's got to become Lord of your life. <coughs> So how, 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 how do I know if I have him as Lord of my life? You ever ask him about what you're doing? Look for his leadership and guidance on how you live your life? You see, this joy can only come into your heart through birth. But how that birth comes about it's all about what you're receiving. You want a Savior. You need a Savior because you know you're a sinner. And you need someone to pay your sin debt. That's what He came to do. Be our Savior to redeem us and save us from our sin. But he'll only be your Savior if He's your Lord. Well, that's where it causes you to want to step back. The rich young ruler? Yeah. That's where he started. I, I don't know this, but I have it in my mind that when he started stepping back, he raised his hands up just like that. <coughs> oh, he was so eager. Good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And when Jesus put his finger on the source of that rich young ruler's problem, that he put his riches ahead of everything else? Salvation couldn't come because he wasn't willing to receive the Lord. You know why salvation doesn't come to your life? You may have prayed and asked Jesus over and over and over and over and over to come to your life, but he'll never come till you're surrendering your all. Doesn't take much of a man to come to God, but it takes all of them. You gotta run up the white flag, you gotta surrender. That's why we sing, I surrender all. You hold anything back, he will not come into your life. I am dead sure of that. And the reason I'm dead sure of it, I tried it. I can't tell you how many times I asked Christ into my heart. I, I'd say over a thousand. 
But in 1983, I got down on my knees and I humbled myself and I didn't leave anything of me there was. I gave it all to him. And you know what? He changed my life. You know why? I received him not only as Savior, but as Lord. I turned my back on him. He said, Brent, have you never messed up since then? I, I, all the time. But I didn't try to withhold anything. You see, the problem with the rich young ruler was he wanted salvation, but he wanted his money ahead of that salvation. God's a jealous God. Anything you're going to put ahead of him, he takes it very personal. He takes it so personal, he'll not bring this joy to your life. Amen. This joy that came through the birth of this baby who was the son of God, the son of man, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham. Baby who is the Savior of the world can only bring this joy into your heart and life when you're willing to receive Him as the Lord of your life, not just the Savior. Of your life. You, you might be here today too and find yourself like David. Boy, he messed up. The theologians tell us. For about a year in his life, he was away from God because of his sin of adultery and murder. When the prophet came to him and confronted him, and he prays that great prayer in Psalm 51. He prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. He didn't get saved again, but he had lost that joy. Some of you in here, you know that you got saved, but you've lost that joy. You've let something come into your life, something to come between you and your relationship with Jesus. You know what you need? You need a prayer of repentance just like David. Restore to me the joy of the salvation that you've given. Christmas is a time of great joy. Joy. Joy to the world. But for that joy to mean anything to you, you've got to experience it. I heard about a, a father who uh, called his family together and said to them, he said, this year, this Christmas is going to be the greatest ever. He said, I want us to be more disciplined this year. I want us to, to watch what we're doing and watch our time. I want us to have a great atmosphere in our home. And man, he was getting pumped up kind of like a football coach before a big game. Tell them what they were going to do to make this the greatest Christmas ever. And his second grader raised his hand and he said, what, son? And the little boy said, how? Could we ever improve on the first Christmas? Yeah. Amen. Well, you can't. And you can't duplicate Christmas. All you can do is experience Christmas. You can't improve on that. But you can experience Christmas in your heart and this joy that this angel told those shepherds about. That joy can be yours. Joy. Joy to the world. It has to come by being birthed into your heart. It can't come in any other way. And it can only be birthed in your heart when you receive Jesus as your Savior, but more importantly, as your Lord. It can get clouded over as it did with David. You lose the joy of your salvation. You may want to get that cleared out. So you can have this wonderful time of joy. I'm going to just ask you to bow your heads. Eric's going to come and he's going to sing about this joy. And then we're going to have a time of invitation. If you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to invite you to come and do that in just a few minutes. If you need to get something out of your life that's clouded your relationship, you can't experience that joy. 
I'm going to invite you to come and deal with it.